Hi, this is Julie Lubinsky. I am the Associate Director of Digital for the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. And I'd like to welcome you all to our special webinar for air travel for wheelchair users. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about our host, John Morris. He is one of the foremost experts in the field of accessible travel, drawing from his experience of nearly 1 million miles flown as a wheelchair user and triple amputee. He educates people with disabilities through his accessible travel website, wheelchairtravel.org. And now I'd like to turn it over to John. Hello, John. Hi, Julie. How are you today? Doing well. Thank you for joining us today. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on air travel for wheelchair users. Uh, I'd like to thank the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation and Julie for inviting me to talk with you today. Now, a quick introduction. Uh, you've already heard my bio. I'm John Morris. I'm a travel addict, aviation geek, and blogger. I run the website wheelchairtravel.org. I'm also a burn survivor, triple amputee, and power wheelchair user. The reason I'm talking with you today is because I fly a lot. In my five years of travel with a wheelchair, I've logged nearly 700 flights, more than 800,000 flown miles, uh, while traveling to nearly 100 airports. So uh, I have quite a bit of experience in the world of air travel. It's one of my greatest joys, and as we talk about it today, I hope my experience and the knowledge I share will be useful to you. Now, a quick overview on our route today. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot to go over. I've tried my best to arrange this presentation chronologically, taking us from booking to baggage claim. So let's get started. I want to first start with uh, planning our journey. So we got to select some flights and figure out who we're flying, where we're flying, how, how we're going to get there. Uh, now, in the United States, we have quite a few airlines to choose from when planning a trip or vacation. Uh, carriers from Alaska Airlines to United can get us where we need to go. But one of the questions that I get all the time is which airline is best for wheelchair users? Uh, this is the number one question I am asked about flying by members of our community. And the truth is, there is no good answer. Our one-off experiences with a carrier don't reveal a whole lot, and we need a large sample size to go off of. I have a large sample size of air travel, taken nearly 700 flights. And based on my experiences, no airline has distinguished themselves above another. The quality of assistance varies according to the airline I'm flying, the airport I'm flying to, who that airline has employed to help me get on and off the airplane, the day of the week, the time of day, the weather outside, and so on. So what we should base our choice of airline off of are things like price, routing, and schedule. We also consider things like aircraft type, uh, the seating uh, arrangement on the airplane, onboard amenities, and the like. Now, all of these things can affect our experience, and we'll talk more about that as we go through this presentation. Now, one of the first decisions we have to make when we're flying is which class of service are we going to fly in? Now, there are so many different classes of services to choose from, uh, from basic economy, economy, main cabin, extra legroom seats, uh, to premium economy on in international flights, domestic first class, uh, so we get a larger seat there, more recline. And then also on our international flights, uh, there are seats that lay fully flat into a bed. So there are a lot of options to choose from. But there are drawbacks uh, to, to each of these, and of course we have to, to take price into account as well. Next thing we consider when we travel is 
whether or not we're going to take a nonstop flight or uh, connecting itinerary. So let's assume for a moment that we're traveling from New York to Los Angeles, and I'm presented with two options. I can fly nonstop in about six hours and 30 minutes, or I could connect in Dallas with a two-hour layover. In total, that layover and the less efficient route with a stop in Dallas adds three hours to the trip. But why would I want a connection over a nonstop? Well, first off, I might be able to get off the airplane, get something to eat, use the bathroom, uh, things like that. But if I take a nonstop, I get there quicker. But if I take a nonstop, I might have to deal with things like how do I manage pressure relief? Uh, can I really sit uh, stationary in an airplane seat for six and a half hours? So a lot of these things are, are things that we need to consider when we're figuring out whether we book the nonstop flight or the connecting itinerary. Uh, and also, at the same time, we're trying to keep things like price uh, into consideration. Now, once we've decided on a flight, we need to request uh, the, the special assistance that will help us on and off the airplane and, and get us situated and make sure that, that uh, everything uh, will be in place to, to get us where we need to go. Uh, the best way to do this is during online booking. Uh, all of the airlines have a, a way to request assistance during the booking process, um, but if you're not able to do it that way, or you have someone else book your flight for you, you can always call the customer assistance line. Uh, some airlines have a dedicated disability line. Um, and then last case, uh, you, can, you can request assistance directly at the airport. Now, there are four letters that I really want you to remember, and they are WCHS. This is the SSR code, or Special Service Request Code, for passengers who are unable to walk and need assistance all the way to the airplane seat. Uh, that's definitely me. Uh, I'm not able to walk, and so I need help from getting from my wheelchair, my own personal wheelchair, uh, directly into the seat of the aircraft. And so the special service that I need to request is for assistance all the way, and that's WCHS. Special assistance, however, is not limited to our mobility impairment. Uh, there are SSR codes for things like allergies, uh, if you need oxygen in flight, uh, intellectual disabilities, if you're bringing a service animal, uh, all sorts of things that, that one uh, can request assistance for, uh, things uh, to, to deal with, with our, our certain disabilities. Now, uh, obviously, uh, uh, one of the things that we're really concerned about uh, is seating. And uh, during the uh, call with the assistant staff, you can request special seating accommodations, like a seat uh, in the bulkhead, uh, which might have uh, extra leg room, or a seat with a movable aisle armrest, uh, so that you don't have to climb over or be lifted over the armrest in order to get into your seat. We'll talk more about these things later. Now I want to focus on the mobility equipment that we're traveling with, uh, specifically uh, wheelchairs, but also talking about some of the medical equipment that might uh, make its way into our luggage. What constitutes medical equipment? Uh, this is a, a very broad term, uh, and, and it's especially important because our medical equipment flies with us free of charge on uh, nearly every airline around the world, um, and so it includes things like, of course, our wheelchairs uh, being a, a necessary device, uh, things like Hoyer lifts, uh, shower chairs, uh, medicine, bandages, um, you know, our CPAP machines, anything uh, that relates to a medical condition and has been prescribed for our use or is necessary um, is, uh, does qualify as medical equipment and then flies for free on most airlines. One thing that I want to note, though, about our medical equipment, uh, particularly medicines and the like, is that it should be packed separately from things like our clothes uh, if you want to take advantage of that opportunity to check the bag for free. 
Uh, airlines uh, are not required to check our clothing for free, um, but they are uh, required to check our, uh, our medical equipment. So it's important to separate that out. There's no question about availing ourselves of those benefits. Now, if you're traveling with a wheelchair, uh, one of the most important things is that it gets to the destination in one piece, in the same condition in which you uh, departed. Uh, the, the wheelchair is critical to our mobility. We all understand this. Um, so here are a couple tips for making sure uh, that our wheelchairs uh, uh, make, it, make it with us safely. Number one is to take apart, to disassemble, and carry on anything that can be removed uh, from the wheelchair. This includes things like our footrests, side guards, uh, bags, cup holders, cushions, even the wheels. Uh, if it can be removed and, and could potentially be damaged during transit, it's important to take that uh, apart and carry it on board the aircraft with you where it'll be safe and, and out, out of the cargo hold. We also want to attach instructions for the proper handling of the wheelchair. Um, you know, especially if you're traveling with a power wheelchair, these instructions are extremely important. Um, and, uh, and it's just very important that the, the baggage handlers will be uh, moving and transporting and loading your mobility equipment know where is the safest place to lift it. Uh, what, how to turn the chair on or off, how to disconnect the power, how to put the wheelchair into freewheel mode. Um, all of these things are very important and uh, you're not going to go down to the, to the ramp of the airport with the staff. So if you can attach some written instructions to help guide them, I think it'll help quite a bit in, in making sure that your wheelchair is handled properly. Now, one thing that's often overlooked is, uh, and, and I also know that not many of us are traveling with these, but collapsible manual wheelchairs uh, may be stored in an onboard closet. Uh, aircraft are, are required by U.S. Uh, regulation to have a closet measuring at least 13 by 36 by 42 inches in the aircraft cabin uh, to uh, store manual wheelchairs. Uh, you can also put uh, um, some of the collapsible or folding power wheelchairs here as well, which we'll talk about those in, in just a minute. But uh, collapsible wheelchairs can be stored on board the aircraft. Uh, if you have, uh, for instance, uh, uh, um, a, a fixed frame wheelchair, which uh, I know many of us do, uh, one of the things that you can do is remove uh, items like the wheels and store those in this closet. So the, the, the closet is designed to, to hold mobility equipment. It's there for your use, and you should uh, certainly take advantage of that. Uh, it's much better to use that to, to protect uh, wheelchairs and mobility equipment than to store the, the bags of the uh, airline crew, which is typically what the space is used for. Now, power wheelchairs, uh, obviously this is something that I deal with uh, all the time because I travel with a power wheelchair of my own. Um, there are a few things that we need to understand. Uh, first are, are battery types. Um, they're, uh, the, the typical uh, uh, battery type uh, that is, is, has been used in power wheelchairs now going back five or 10 years is the dry or gel cell battery. These uh, batteries are sealed so they don't leak um, and they uh, um, are just much safer for air travel. And for this reason, when you travel with a wheelchair with a, a dry or a gel cell battery, you're allowed to keep the battery in the wheelchair. You don't have to do anything uh, except turn the chair off and, and, and disengage it. So, um, you know, you just stick a, stick a plug in or, or unplug the power cable uh, to disengage the chair, but you don't have to remove the batteries. And so uh, as long as I've had a wheelchair 
my wheelchairs have had dry cell batteries, and so I've always uh, been able to get them on the aircraft uh, without any problem. Uh, wet cell batteries have to be removed, uh, but I have not, uh, I've not uh, seen a new wheelchair manufactured with a wet cell battery uh, in my entire time as a wheelchair user or, or my time writing about accessible travel. So I think it's very rare for you to have to deal with that. But one thing that is happening now is an increasing number of wheelchairs, particularly the folding wheelchair types, um, use lithium-ion batteries. Uh, these batteries are much more efficient and can get much longer range, um, but there are a couple things you need to know. First, if the lithium-ion battery can be removed, it is not, it cannot be more than 300 watt hours in uh, capacity. So you're allowed to travel uh, with, with the chair, but uh, it cannot be more than 300 watt hours of capacity on that lithium ion battery. Uh, some of the more popular um, of these folding wheelchair types, like the Easy Light Cruiser, have a battery that is specifically made to be uh, air travel uh, compliant or, or capable of adhering to this limitation. Um, so check that out with the manufacturer of your chair. Figure out how many watt hours your battery is uh, to see if the wheelchair can fly as is or if you'll need to get a different uh, lower capacity battery. You're also allowed to travel with a spare battery of up to 300 watt hours or two spare batteries of no more than 160 watt hours each. Um, something else that's also interesting is if you have a, a wheelchair that has a lithium ion battery uh, that cannot be removed from the chair, that is not designed uh, to be removed uh, by, by the user, then there is no limit on the size of that particular battery. So uh, I just want to warn you, though, that some airlines are a little confused on that regulation, so you may have to uh, talk, talk it over with them and make sure that they understand uh, the policy uh, differences between a, a lithium-ion powered chair with a removable battery versus a non-removable battery. And one last thing to note on uh, power wheelchairs and battery uh, types. Uh, a lot of us uh, have a smart drive power assist that is used uh, with manual wheelchairs. Uh, these devices can fly, but they'll have to be carried onto the airplane. So take it on board with you, put it up in the overhead bin, uh, and then it'll be there uh, when, you're, when your manual wheelchair is uh, returned to you on arrival at the next airport. A couple more tips for flying with a power wheelchair to help avoid damage. Uh, these wheelchairs are much more likely to be damaged by airlines than manual wheelchairs uh, just because they're extremely heavy. Uh, my own wheelchair weighs uh, just a little more than 400 pounds. So that's quite a lot for the airline and its baggage handlers uh, to deal with. Uh, and oftentimes uh, chairs will come back with some scrapes and bruises, uh, but anyway, um, the number one most important thing that I can share with you about traveling with a wheelchair, a power wheelchair, is to check the cargo door dimensions for your aircraft type. Uh, Wheelchairs uh, do not fit upright in every cargo hold. Uh, the Boeing 737 is the most popular commercial airliner in the world, and the height of its cargo door is only 35 inches. So many power wheelchairs are much taller than 35 inches, and the only way that they'll fit in is if they're put on their side. Unless, of course, you figure out how to, to decrease the height of your wheelchair to make sure that it will fit within the cargo hold 
of the aircraft you're flying on. So I fly on Boeing 737s all the time. The top of my seat back on my power wheelchair is about four and a half feet tall. So it won't fit in the Boeing 737 unless I do something to reduce that height. I recline the seat back, remove the armrests, and that gets the chair uh, to be under that required 35 inches to make sure it'll fit upright and never has to be put on its side. When you put a 400 pound power wheelchair on its side and drag it up a belt loader into the aircraft cargo hold, it's bound to get damaged. So check the cargo door dimensions for your flight to make sure that you'll fit, uh, your wheelchair will fit on that airplane. Uh, that is the number one reason power wheelchairs are damaged because they were put on their sides or their backs uh, because they were taken off their wheels. Um, if you do have to disassemble the wheelchair, the airport personnel will help you with it. They're obligated to do so, but they need instructions and they also need the tools needed to do that. Um, most power wheelchairs come with a toolkit uh, that'll work with all the bolts and levers and screws uh, to, to disassemble it in whatever manner uh, needs to be done. I recommend that you talk uh, with your wheelchair supplier to get some information on how best to go about doing that and get everything you need to take to the airport. Um, also note that if you are bringing tools like uh, wrenches or screwdrivers, they have to be seven inches uh, or less in length. Uh, that is the only way they will get through the TSA security checkpoint. Uh, and then also one last thing is disabling and disconnecting the battery and the controller. Um, it took us all probably a little while to learn how to drive our power wheelchairs. Uh, we don't want to put a baggage handler in our wheelchair. Uh, uh, you know, it could be the first time they've ever driven one, and we don't want to see them driving it into the walls of the jet bridge, uh, which I, you know, I learned that lesson early on in my uh, wheelchair travel uh, uh, experience. If for some reason your wheelchair is damaged, uh, US airlines are responsible for repairing or replacing the damaged wheelchair up to the original purchase price. So uh, if your wheelchair is damaged and, or destroyed, God forbid, and it is a $30,000 wheelchair, well, the airline will have to replace that. Um, fortunately, I, I just want to say that uh, serious damage like this is extremely rare. Um, you know, most things are, are purely cosmetic uh, or, or minor damage. Uh, I've had my share of damage, and on the whole, serious damage is quite rare. Uh, if your wheelchair is damaged, it's important to report it before leaving the airport. Uh, the airline will typically hook you up with a third-party contractor to help organize the repairs, send a technician out to meet you, provide loaner equipment if necessary. Um, some of these contractors, the two largest, uh, one is called Global Repair Group. The other is uh, Scoot Around. Uh, these companies uh, help connect uh, uh, airline passengers whose wheelchairs have been damaged with all of the resources they need to get it repaired. And then, of course, on behalf of the airline, they foot the bill. Um, a new thing that ha has just uh, happened and begun, actually, is that airlines must now report uh, the number of wheelchairs that they damage each month to the Department of Transportation. So we only have one month of data in. It's not statistically significant, so I didn't want to share that data. But if you Google uh, airline wheelchair damage data, you will find a list of the first month, 
Uh, in another couple of weeks, we'll have another month's uh, set of data. And then as we get more, we can start figuring out maybe which airlines are doing a better job and then watch that data to see if airlines who are you know, maybe mishandling a lot of wheelchairs start to treat them better and implement new programs to, to ensure that wheelchairs are treated um, and respect, treated well and respected um, sort of in response to that data. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Now let's move uh, along our sort of accessible travel itinerary uh, to the airport itself. Uh, we've got our flight booked. We have a plan for making sure uh, that our wheelchair uh, will be uh, handled properly at the airport. But now we're here to check in, go through security, and get on the airplane. So starting with check-in. Uh, check-in, the check-in desk is actually where passenger assistance begins. Um, so uh, it's here that you'll, you'll begin to be offered assistance. Uh, you can have a, a, an airport, con an airline contractor walk with you uh, throughout the journey or push you if you're going to uh, use an airport wheelchair. Um, Airline uh, assistance uh, for, for uh, people with disabilities begins at that check-in desk. Um, so here is where you'll confirm uh, any of the special assistance that you've requested. Uh, if you've requested uh, an aisle chair uh, to board the aircraft, which we'll talk about in just a minute, um, that uh, is something you'll want to confirm first at the check-in desk. Uh, you'll also check in your luggage and any of your uh, medical equipment or supplies. Uh, your wheelchair does not have to be turned over at the gate. This is something that you can take uh, through security and take all the way to the gate. You do not have to surrender it at the check-in desk. Um, and then assistance personnel, of course, as I said, can meet you there. Uh, right at the check-in desk or at the gate or, or really wherever in that, in that travel uh, ribbon that you would like. Next stop after we have our boarding pass and we're checked in is uh, the security checkpoint. Um, there are a few things uh, that go into uh, the security uh, check or, or um, uh, screening of wheelchair users, but there are some things that you'll want to remember. First of all is if you're a wheelchair user, you have every right to remain seated in your wheelchair during the entire screening. Um, I can't stand up. I don't have legs, so I'm surely not getting out of my wheelchair. Uh, and so uh, this is a right for all wheelchair users to, to undergo the screening while seated in their wheelchairs. Uh, secondly, uh, the screening consists of a full body pat down by an officer of the same gender. So I'm a guy, I'm always going to be receiving a pat down from a male TSA uh, agent. Um, you know, we, we of course hear some stories on the internet, but I will say that, that every one of my screening experiences with TSA, uh, the, the agents have demonstrated great respect, and it's been a pretty quick process, uh, five minutes at the most to go through the pat-down um, itself. Uh, third, you'll undergo an explosives test or the swab of the hands and your wheelchair. So they're going to uh, just run a, a swab to, to check in and see if there's any residue uh, from explosives, uh, any trace elements of those things. Now and again, uh, there will be a false alarm. Uh, in all of my hundreds of flights, I think I've only had four or five false alarms. Uh, that just earns you a second pat down. Uh, just to make sure that, that nothing uh, was, was, was hidden from, from the security agents. Uh, and then fourth is the inspection of the wheelchair itself. Uh, they'll pat down your seat cushions, so you might have to t 
turn to the side or lift yourself up if you're able to uh, bend forward a little bit so they can pat the backrest. Uh, just making sure that nothing is hidden uh, in the wheelchair itself. A couple of tips to get you through uh, the, the airport security experience. Uh, first off is a program called TSA CARES. Um, what you can do is you call this helpline. It's 1-855-787-2226. Uh, and when you call them, they can answer any questions you have about the screening experience for wheelchair users. Uh, they, they, will, they, they have all of the information at their fingertips, can help you and explain TSA policies and procedures, but you can also request a passenger support specialist to meet you. This is an a incredible program where uh, essentially uh, you'll, the, the TSA will hook you up with an employee who has been trained specifically to help people with disabilities get through the security checkpoint in a, as effortless a way as possible. Uh, they'll be there to be your advocate, to make sure that everything goes in the way that it should, and they'll also help you, uh, you know, making sure that, that all of the required items are out of your bag and that you're getting uh, uh, assistance with the actual screening uh, in, a, in a timely manner. Uh, the, the passenger support specialists are just uh, great people who are looking to help, and uh, this is something that you uh, are able to take advantage of for free. Second tip is to print out and fill uh, a TSA notification card. Uh, this is a little card, a uh, piece of paper that gives you an opportunity to write down any information that you think that uh, the, the screening personnel, the transportation security officers, should know about you and your disability. So for instance, if you're traveling with a leg bag uh, and uh, you don't want to you know, blurt that out to every other passenger in the screening checkpoint around you, uh, you can write that down on the notification card, pass that to the agent, and you've discreetly shared uh, the information uh, that they need to know, um, you know, to, to keep that in mind during your screening. Uh, and lastly, uh, if you're planning to travel uh, more than once or twice a year by air, I really encourage you to sign up for a program called TSA PreCheck. Uh, this gives you expedited screening, uh, so you don't have to remove electronics or um, certain liquids from your bag uh, as it goes through the x-ray machine, but most importantly, you're, all, you're allowed to skip the physical pat-down uh, of your person. So they'll still check your wheelchair, but they will not touch you if you have TSA pre-check. Uh, so that's something to really look into. Uh, there is a, a cost, but you only have to pay the fee, I think it's $85 currently. You have to pay that once every five years. Uh, so you get five years of expedited airport screening for $85. Uh, this program uh, does involve a background check. Uh, so just uh, to understand that when you're going, going into it, uh, it's designed to um, identify low-risk travelers uh, so you get some leeway in the security screening checkpoint uh, if the government is able to determine that you are a low risk. So we've gone through security, now we're headed to the boarding gate. And this is a very important step in the process because it's going to lead us to getting on the airplane itself. Uh, I recommend that you arrive at the gate between 45 minutes and one hour prior to uh, scheduled departure of your flight. Uh, this is important because airlines are boarding flights anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes before departure. So you want to get there before boarding starts. Uh, the first thing that you should say uh, to the, uh, the airline uh, gate agent 
is that you would like to pre-board the aircraft on account of your disability. Uh, this is a right guaranteed to us uh, by uh, U.S. regulation and the Air Carrier Access Act. Uh, we have a right to pre-board the aircraft. Uh, the benefits of pre-boarding are many. Uh, you get to get on the airplane and get settled uh, before anyone else is on the aircraft, so you're not disrupted, you're not rushed. The people assisting you on board the aircraft uh, have the time to time to help you, um, and it's just a, a much more dignified experience to board the aircraft first. Uh, during the boarding process, you also need to get uh, a tag uh, for your personal wheelchair if you're traveling with one so that it can be returned to you at the arrival airport. Um, the wheelchairs, uh, gate-checked wheelchairs, where you've turned the wheelchair over at the gate, are returned back to you uh, as soon as you land. Um, so if you're flying from uh, New York uh, to Los Angeles, you'll get it in Los Angeles. But if you're flying from New York to Dallas to Los Angeles, you'll get it back in Dallas and then again in Los Angeles. Uh, so you're allowed to get your wheelchair back uh, on connections after each flight. Uh, it's very important to have your own wheelchair that so, so that you can go independently uh, to the bathroom, uh, to, to go get something to eat. Uh, just that sense of independence in the airport, I think, is, is very important, and it's a great benefit to us all. And then, of course, at the gate, if you need to make any last-minute adjustments to your seating, uh, you can do that with the gate agent. So once, we, uh, once we've worked all that out with the gate agent, we're going to head down the jet bridge, typically, uh, to get onto our flight. So uh, the way that we're going to do that is uh, with an aisle chair. Uh, the aisle chair is a small uh, wheelchair that is narrow enough to fit down the aisle uh, of the aircraft uh, to take us directly on board to our seats. Um, getting into this, uh, you see here in, in uh, the largest photo here on the slide, I'm sitting in my own personal power wheelchair about to get into the small uh, aisle chair. So the aisle chair is brought right up next to my wheelchair, and uh, there are two ways of transferring. Uh, one um, is uh, on your own. If you can just scoot over from your wheelchair into the aisle chair, you're free to do that. And then you can also get an assisted lift by the airline personnel. They'll grab you from under your arms and under your legs uh, and help you move over uh, into the aisle chair. And then the aisle chair is taken on board the aircraft, and that process of transferring is repeated in getting you into uh, your seat. But something that happens quite a bit uh, here in the United States and also around the world is that not every, uh, not every airport uh, has jet bridges, or we're not always getting on uh, the airplane uh, via a jet bridge. Uh, remote gates and stands are used uh, all over the world, uh, and in these cases, able-bodied passengers typically board the aircraft by climbing a set of stairs. Of course, uh, for wheelchair users, uh, stairs are a problem. They are not accessible, and so we have to get on in, in another way. Uh, there are three ways that this is typically handled. Uh, the first is an ambulance truck. Uh, it's essentially a catering truck or a truck uh, with a, a scissor lift to help elevate uh, the cabin of the vehicle up to the side of the aircraft so that, uh, you know, you go from inside this truck and are able to be wheeled directly in uh, to the airplane uh, using what is called this ambulift high loader uh, vehicle. Second uh, is by ramp. Uh, they can just roll a ramp right up to the aircraft. Uh, this happens quite a bit uh, in different airports uh, around, uh, around the country. Uh, Miami and Charlotte come to mind, uh, and also smaller regional airports 
uh, as well that uh, uh, maybe uh, only accept smaller uh, regional type aircraft. Uh, and then the third is a wheelchair lift. Uh, the, the third photo here uh, is of a propeller plane. Uh, it's a Silver Airways uh, propeller plane. And uh, I was actually uh, taken on board the aircraft using this lift, which is cranked up to be level with the door of the aircraft. Uh, and then I'm just rolled right uh, onto the plane. Uh, so these are the three ways that we can board without a jet bridge. Of course, I always prefer to uh, you know, board the jet bridge. You're not exposed to the weather. Uh, so obviously, the jet bridge in that sense uh, is, is preferable. Section four, um, let's talk about what it's like uh, on the airplane and things to look for, like seating, uh, lavatories. Can, can you go to the bathroom uh, on the airplane? and some of the other accessible features uh, that we might find. First off is seating. Um, many uh, agents of, or staff of airlines think that the bulkhead seat is the best for people with disabilities and, and wheelchair users because it's at the front of the airplane. There are bulkhead seats in first class and in economy class. Um, and uh, many times it's thought uh, by, by airline personnel that uh, as close to the front as possible within your class of service is what you would prefer. But the thing about bulkhead seats is in most cases, they have a movable armrests. So you'll have to be lifted uh, over the armrest, uh, there's no way to slide across directly into the seat from the aisle chair. Uh, since these seats are in the front of the cabin, uh, there's no seat uh, in front of them uh, under which you can store your belongings, like your bag or your backpack, uh, things like that. So then you'll need assistance in getting those things out of the overhead bin uh, and also putting them back into the overhead bin. Um, and then also, uh, since they have fixed armrests, uh, things like the tray tables are built into the armrests uh, in, in bulkhead seats. And so there is no, uh, there's slightly uh, reduced seat width as a result of that. Uh, on the flip side, though, you get some extra leg room, uh, which, which can certainly be nice uh, uh, for, for many of us who are taller. Now, the aisle seat, uh, uh, seats typically uh, behind, uh, uh, one, say, one row behind the bulkhead uh, row will have a movable aisle armrest. So the, the armrest swings up, and then I can easily transfer into the seat. Um, but then the question is, do I want to sit in this aisle seat, uh, or do I want to sit in the window? Now, although this picture is of me sitting in an aisle seat, my preference is actually the window. And that's because I don't like other passengers climbing over me. Uh, I prefer to just go into the window seat uh, and, and sit there until the flight is over and not be bothered and not have anyone climbing over me or hitting me with their bags uh, as they walk by me in the aisle. Uh, but a lot of people uh, still prefer uh, the, the aisle seat. That's a matter of personal preference, but just some things to think about. Uh, if you're traveling alone, uh, the window seat can be even more preferable. But if you're traveling with someone, uh, perhaps uh, you don't want them sitting in the, in the, uh, the middle seat. Uh, maybe if you sat in the aisle, they could sit. Uh, in the aisle seat across from you, and you could both have aisle seats. There are a lot of things uh, to, to consider. Um, when you are booking your seat, however, you have a right uh, as a wheelchair user to a seat with a movable aisle armrest. And so when you are booking your flight or selecting seats, uh, call the airline uh, and let them know that you will need it. Uh, to be in a row with a movable aisle armrest, if that's what you would like. Uh, you are certainly entitled to that.
Now, I want to talk about some of the aircraft types. We talked about uh, the Boeing 737 earlier and its uh, relatively small cargo hold dimensions. Uh, that is actually a narrow body airplane. It's a single aisle airplane. Uh, it, uh, that photo that I just showed you, in fact, I'll uh, go back to it. Uh, this here is me seated on a Boeing 737 aircraft. Uh, the, there's a single aisle, and on each side there are three seats. But not every airplane is that way. In fact, even single aisle airplanes are not all the same. Uh, the smallest single aisle airplanes uh, uh, have seats in a one two configuration. So there are three seats total, one on one side of the aisle, and two seats on the other side of the aisle. There are also uh, airplanes with seats in a two two and two three configuration that are narrow body planes. Uh, on the wide body side, there's just as much variation. Uh, seats in 232, 242, 333, and 343 configurations uh, are all possible. Uh, these are uh, airplanes like the Airbus A330, the Boeing 767, 777, 787, uh, the Airbus A380. Uh, so there are so many uh, different airplanes and so many different seating configurations. But what's really different uh, about, uh, about these airplane types is, one, uh, the single aisle airplanes uh, typically do not have an accessible lavatory. They are not required and, in fact, very rare. Uh, there are a couple of airlines uh, in the U.S., uh, that have some uh, narrow body airplanes with lavatories that are accessible or at least partially accessible to uh, wheelchair users and the aisle chair. Uh, Delta uh, uh, is the launch airline here in the United States for the Airbus A220. I think they only have five or six of those planes right now, uh, but they do have an accessible lavatory. Uh, Frontier has some uh, planes uh, with an accessible lavatory, but these are not things that you will want to count on when traveling on a single aisle airplane. Uh, and they also have small, smaller cargo hold sizes, so if you're traveling with a power wheelchair, you might have to do some additional thinking uh, and, uh, and, and taking things apart uh, for your power wheelchair to fit it in the cargo hold. Now, meanwhile, the wide-body airplanes and accessible lavatory is required by the U.S.'s Air Carrier Access Act. They have larger cargo holds, uh, and also in some premium cabins in a seating situation, uh, flatbed seats are, are pretty common in business and first class. Uh, on wide body planes. So this might also be something uh, that you'd want to consider uh, when you're traveling uh, on a longer flight. Now, what do accessible airplane lavatories look like? Well, here are uh, a few pictures of the most common designs. Uh, the, best, the best design, in my opinion, is in the lower uh, left-hand corner of this slide. You can see that there's space next to the toilet for a wheelchair, which in this case would be an onboard aisle chair. Uh, Wide-body airplanes or airplanes with accessible lavatories have an onboard aisle chair, and uh, the cabin crew, the flight attendants, will assist you to the lavatory using that onboard uh, that onboard aisle chair. So uh, that, uh, that is uh, certainly an option. Uh, so like I said, the lower left-hand corner here, uh, this, this uh, bathroom design is very common on the Boeing 777. It, it, I've also found it on a number of Boeing 787s. Um, but on the flip side, uh, if we go just right from there, we see a bathroom that has two toilets. Uh, what this actually is is uh, uh, two standard bathrooms with a collapsible wall in between. Uh, 
And so that's done to give additional space uh, to the individual. Um, uh, and that, that is, this, is a, this is a design that's common on aircraft like the Airbus A330 and also the Boeing 787, uh, Boeing 767. Uh, so a lot of different types of airplanes employ this design. And the one there at the top is from an Airbus A380. Uh, it's a very spacious bathroom, but uh, you have to, to transfer onto the front of the toilet as opposed to being able to put the aisle chair directly alongside the toilet. So uh, again, that, that, that toilet design, that bathroom lavatory design is, uh, is focused. Uh, in my favorite is, is the one in the bottom left uh, corner. Um, do you have to be independent in transferring on and off the toilet? I'm just seeing this come through, and I will get to all of the questions uh, from earlier if they haven't been answered already. But do you have to be uh, independent in transferring on and off the toilet? Yes. Uh, the cabin crew are not required and should not be expected uh, to help you uh, in the lavatory. So you'll need to either be able to do this yourself or uh, travel with a companion who can offer that assistance to you. Now, last uh, and final section here on our travel itinerary is understanding some of the rights that we have as passengers with disabilities. And this is something that I'm extremely passionate about. I could do an entire presentation on this. Uh, so I'm just going to speed through this really quickly, though, so that I can answer some of your questions. Um, the Air Carrier Access Act, um, was uh, signed into law uh, in 1986. Uh, it is air travel's equivalent of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It tells airlines that they have to serve people with disabilities and they can't discriminate against us on the basis of our disability. Um, airlines uh, um, you know, fought this uh, regulation in the 1980s, but now it is the law of the land, uh, and it's made uh, so many improvements in our experience, such as uh, wheelchair assistance um, is free throughout. So that assistance with boarding and deplaning um, and carriage of our wheelchairs and mobility equipment, uh, uh, access to the lavatory, help to and from the lavatory on the airplane, uh, being able to travel with our service animals, all of these things came from the Air Carrier Access Act, and we are not charged anything additional uh, for, for taking advantage of these services. Airlines are, are also um, restricted from refusing transportation to people with disabilities. Um, they're also not allowed to uh, require that we travel with uh, companions, except in extremely limited circumstances. Um, uh, the general rule for whether or not you can travel alone on the airplane is, can you feed yourself, um, and uh, can you aid in your own evacuation? So essentially, uh, what aiding in your own evacuation uh, means uh, now is uh, can you provide instructions uh, in, in some form. So this is uh, uh, extremely uh, protective. Occasionally we hear about an airline denying a, a wheelchair user the right to travel uh, and then they get fined for it because the DOT uh, has held uh, generally that if you, can, if you can turn up at the airport on your own, uh, then you can fly alone. Uh, and uh, I think it's very important to, to uh, ensure the freedom of movement of people with disabilities uh, and guarantee our right uh, to move about society, whether that's on an airplane or the city bus or in a taxi. Uh, all of these things are very important. One limitation, though, and one major difference between the ACAA and the ADA is that we, as people with disabilities, have no private right of action. So if an airline violates our rights, the only thing that we can do is, 
is, is turn to the DOT, uh, file a complaint, and ask them to take action. And so last slide here before I get to questions. And it's five things to do in the event of a violation. So uh, there are so many rights. I, I encourage you to look them up online or on my website, wheelchairtravel.org, where I've written extensively about the ACAA. Uh, things like the airline took too long to return your wheelchair, or they didn't give you the seat that you needed, or they didn't allow you to pre-board the aircraft. All of these things that I said throughout this presentation that you are guaranteed, these are rights under the Air Carrier Access Act. And when they are violated, we need to do these five things. First, recognize that an issue has occurred. Uh, we have to, you know, in order to, for our rights to have been violated, we have to know that they have been violated, right? And then secondly, at the airport, we can request uh, that the airline uh, present to us their complaint resolution official. This is an individual who is supposed to have been trained on the Air Carrier Access Act and who is empowered to resolve your complaint uh, and hopefully correct the issue that has occurred. But uh, in this sense, uh, if you're speaking to a CRO and you claim, if you say point blank that I believe that my rights under the ACAA have been violated, then you are owed and required, uh, the airline is required to send you a written response, either denying or confirming that they, they violated uh, your rights under the law. The next step is you can file a complaint with the DOT. If you're either unsatisfied uh, with what has happened uh, or the response you've received, or you just want to make sure the DOT knows that this happened to you, you can file a complaint online uh, at transportation.gov uh, where you can, you can uh, tell them about what has happened uh, to you. They will then, step five, actually investigate this. They'll demand that the airline respond to them within a specified period of time. They'll take all of that into consideration. They will reveal your comments compare those with what the airline has said, get any additional evidence that they need, whether it be you know, airport video footage uh, or uh, other statements. They will perform a thorough investigation of the complaint and then determine, they will issue a determination of whether or not a violation had, had occurred or not. And if a violation did occur, that is permanent, that, that, that file is kept it's put into the airline's record, uh, and they may even take action on it, which can be in the form of a fine or a cease and desist letter. Uh, but either way, uh, these DOT complaints mean a great deal. And I, I encourage you, uh, if your rights are violated, which I hope they won't be, but if they are, I encourage you to take action. Let the DOT know this happened uh, to you, uh, because in terms of solving problems, we can't solve a problem if we don't know that it exists. So uh, with that, I'm going to move into to looking over your questions here. I'll try to answer a few before we have to shut down. Uh, and if you have any others, send them in now. Uh, so uh, a question here about a uh, should you buy or make a canvas or a fabric bag? Uh, should you bring that on board and store it to prevent dings or paint chips? Uh, absolutely, you can cover your, your wheelchair. Uh, um, I've heard a, a lot of people talk about bubble wrap and things like that, but bubble wrap, uh, quite frankly, is, uh, is not going to do much to, in my opinion, to protect a wheelchair in an airplane cargo hold. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, if you want to cover a manual wheelchair or a power wheelchair with a canvas or a cover, sort of like you would a car cover, um, uh, to protect it from any dings or scrapes, I think that's a great idea. Uh, definitely can't hurt. Um, place to download a handy cheat sheet on these regulations. Uh, I'll go ahead and progress to the next slide here. 
please do check out my website, uh, wheelchairtravel.org. I'm also on social media, uh, at wheelchair, uh, at wctravel.org is my Twitter account, and facebook.com slash wheelchair travel. Uh, you can find uh, my, uh, my website. There's an entire section on air travel and the Air Carrier Access Act, uh, so, so be sure to check that out. Um, uh, yes, if a passenger has uh, intellectual disabilities and is accompanied by caregivers, can they remain with the passenger through the boarding process? Yes. Um, uh, if you are a person with a disability, uh, you can absolutely bring your travel companions uh, with you during the boarding process. Uh, you ask for pre-boarding. The whole idea is to get you uh, and your group of people who are assisting you uh, on the plane uh, with dignity and respect. Um, so, so absolutely. Uh, um, uh, do armrests always flip up? Uh, no. Uh, half of the armrests on airplanes uh, in each class of service are now required uh, to be movable, meaning they flip up or, or um, in some business class seats recess. Uh, so uh, half of them do, uh, at, at least half of them do. I said earlier that in bulkhead seats, it's very rare for the armrest to be anything but fixed. Um, so if you're looking for a movable aisle armrest, you'll probably need to choose a seat uh, in, a, in a row other than the bulkhead row, uh, but check with your airline. They're required to let you know uh, which seats uh, have a movable aisle armrest. Um, have you traveled to Santiago, Spain? Airline recommendation. Uh, as I said earlier, I don't necessarily have um, – uh, an airline that I would recommend above others. But uh, many U.S. airlines uh, fly uh, to Europe and Asia and, and, and Australia and all over the world. Um, I think that uh, uh, typically what I would say is that I would generally prefer uh, to fly on a U.S. airline over a foreign carrier uh, if I'm concerned about the Air Carrier Access Act. Uh, and uh, specifically some of my rights, uh, because the ACAA um, applies to U.S. carriers all over the world, um, and they are much more in tune, in my opinion, with making sure uh, that, that things are done, such as uh, you know the return of the wheelchair at the gate. Uh, I've generally had a lot better luck with U.S. carriers than, than, than international ones. Uh, and the last question is, can I take my uh, power wheelchair on the plane? Uh, any restrictions on its weight? Uh, there are no restrictions on the weight of the wheelchair. Uh, my wheelchair is a little more than 400 pounds. Uh, it flies with me everywhere. Um, and, uh, and so there's been no problem with that. Uh, of course, taking the power wheelchair, my power wheelchair, which is a complex uh, rehab chair with tilt and recline and all that, um, I couldn't take that in the aircraft cabin itself, so it's stored in the cargo hold. But some of the uh, uh, collapsible, portable power wheelchairs uh, can be stored in that onboard closet. Um, and one last question. Uh, let me read this really quick. Uh, so this is a great question. Um, uh, Fred uh, has just asked, uh, am I aware of any airline or aircraft manufacturer planning to or in the process of making their planes accessible uh, so that you can essentially uh, tie down your wheelchair like you do in a van or an automobile or the city bus? Um, uh, there is a uh, there are a number of groups working on this uh, issue right now. Uh, Flying disabled uh, is one of them in the UK, and um, I'm blanking right now on the US one. Uh, um, but uh, there are groups 
there are groups that are working on this, uh, trying to work with airlines. I do not think it's something that's going to happen immediately, but it's certainly a discussion that's being had, and I hope in my lifetime that it, that it will be uh, uh, reality. Um, what if you have to go to the bathroom uh, and can't get to it, uh, like on a, on a plane with a non-accessible bathroom? Uh, that um, there, there are a lot of people do uh, different things. Uh, catheterizing with a leg bag, I think, is the most common thing uh, that that uh, our community uh, would be doing. I fly a lot, so I've gotten really good at uh, at holding it. Uh, but uh, there's a certain length of flight that I won't touch. Uh, more than six hours without an accessible bathroom is just not something that I can do. Uh, that is not uh, that is not possible. So uh, I was talking earlier about the need to take uh, connections um, and uh, or the, uh, the trying to decide whether or not to take a connection. I think that's uh, something you have to consider. And for international flights, there are some flights now across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they're operated by narrow body planes. I encourage you, if you want access to an accessible bathroom, to avoid those. Uh, take the flights on the airlines that are flying wide body jets or fly on the routes uh, to Europe with wide body airplanes uh, so you'll have access to that lavatory. Um, and, and very last question before I have to wrap this up, do you have a favorite travel wheelchair? Um, uh, wow, we have a lot of <laughs> we uh, uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, favorite travel wheelchair? Uh, I always travel exclusively with my uh, power wheelchair. Uh, I'm in the market for a new one right now, so I don't know which I'm going to get. But I've been flying with the Quantum Q6 Edge. Uh, which I have uh, loved, um, but you know now right now I I'm in the market for one, so I'm not sure what I'm going to get next. Um, can you bring a separate Roho cushion for use uh, on the airplane seat? Absolutely, that is medical equipment. Uh, if you need an extra cushion, uh, remember medical equipment qualifies uh, as so much. I mean, even you can bring a you can fly for free with a shower chair. Um, and uh, uh, how old am I? I am almost 30 years old, uh, almost uh, a few more months. And uh, anyway, thank you, everyone. I think, uh, Julie, that is where uh, I'm going to gonna wrap things up. We've answered all of the questions. Uh, thank you again so much for having me. And, folks, uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of this is repeated uh, on the website, uh, wheelchairtravel.org, and of course you'll be able to uh, download and check this out on uh, YouTube uh, soon. Yes, thank you, John. Thank you, for everybody, for joining us and for your wonderful questions. Have a good day. concludes today's webinar. Thank you for your participation.